Welcome to Dividing Lines, a series of special programs from the Near Futurist, where we will be bringing together respected innovators and thinkers to examine some of the most consequential debates in technology and society today. Dividing Lines is powered by Diffusion, an award-winning international PR agency on a mission to help tech innovators to take on the status quo and transform the future faster. My name is Guy Clapperton, and if you wanted to feed back on the podcast or maybe even suggest ideas for guests and topics, I'd love to meet you in the shiny new LinkedIn group I've set up. Just search for my name and Near Futurist and you'll find it pretty easily. Now, my wife and I are eating a bit less red meat. We're not inclined towards vegetarianism as long as farming is done humanely. That's not a problem for us, although I respect others will disagree with that. That's fair enough. Now, our main issue is with greenhouse gas emissions and the ecological impact of meat production on planet Earth. That's where we live. I'm no expert, but even with my limited knowledge, I can see that something has to change. If only someone would invent a way of cultivating meat in laboratories. That's a bit of a clunky link. Yes, of course they have. You know it and I know it, although it's not on the supermarket shelves just yet. The future of meat production may well be artificial or laboratory based, although a lot of people will feel that natural production is best. So to discuss this, I'm very pleased to welcome two guests. Meatable is a startup focusing on lab grown meat. And from that company, we have Dan Launing, founder and CTO of Meatable. And to represent the more traditional view of farming and the countryside economy, although I don't want to put words into his mouth, we have the chief executive of the Countryside Alliance in the UK, that's Tim Bonner. Welcome to you both. Morning. Welcome. Thanks. Well, perhaps we could start with uh, Meetable. I mean, uh, uh, Dan, could you tell me a bit about what you do exactly? Yeah, I would love to. So uh, you said synthetic, but basically what we're using is the cells of an animal. So like the the natural building blocks of life uh, to create a product that everybody likes to enjoy, like yourself. You just said that you and your wife eat a little bit of uh, less of red meat, but people still do eat a lot of meat. And by this new way of producing meat, but without harming the animals, uh, I think we can create a future where we really can still satisfy the the, uh, the need and the requirements for people to uh, to eat meat, but then without damage to the environment, animals, or uh, the planet as a whole. Okay, so uh, the motivation clearly is to be more humane and uh, environmental, but there are humane and increasingly environmental methods of traditional farming. What's the motivation behind going lab-grown? Oh, so I think we have to do everything to make sure that we reach a future where everybody can eat high quality protein, can eat a nice steak, uh, basically have your steak and eat it too. But then uh, I think there should be choice. So right now you can either say, well, we'll have a plant uh, product or a uh, animal product, but some people like yourself are being more conscious of the effect that meat has on this planet. Uh, so that's why using a different methodology to produce the same product, because it is actual meat, right? It comes from an animal. It actually is muscle and fat from an animal, but then without the slaughter. I think having choices in that is all the better for consumers, but definitely saying it's an ant game. We need and to have alternatives and to make sure we farm more humanely. So that's why really I think this technology can provide in that. Okay, I'm sure it's more complex than I'm about to ask. Tim, I will get to you in just a second. But you mentioned that it comes from an animal, but you've also mentioned that it's lab grown so you don't harm the animal. Could you talk me through the basics of how you actually grow uh, the meat that you produce? Yeah, of course. So we take a small sample of cells from an animal uh, and then we place it in a protective environment Basically, like your, you should think a little bit about the beer brewing operation, where you have cattle, and there is where you keep the yeast in. But in our case, it's animal cells, and you feed it anything that basically an animal would eat, but only then broken down in its fundamental building blocks: so sugars, salt, amino acids, uh, to just to make sure that these cells can consume this in a very readily available manner, since it doesn't have any digestive tract anymore, right? So we break it down for these cells, and they can easily absorb it to make more cells. And then at the moment when we have a lot of these cells, then we say, well, now we want you to turn into muscle and fat. Uh, and that basically creates everything that you expect from a, a steak or a tunador or an antreco, just a normal muscle and fat from an animal. Well, so far you've got me thinking about steaks and beer. So you're winning the debate, but then the other person hasn't spoken. So, um, Tim, there's, there is some research out there to suggest that traditional meat production does produce harmful greenhouse gases. Before we even consider the lab grown alternative, what can farmers do to reduce their carbon footprint? The first point is that the production of, of greenhouse gases by traditional livestock 
production, you, you call it, covers is actually it's a sweeping generalization. It covers a huge range of different production systems. Um, and so, you know, when we when we're considering beef production, uh, for instance, there would be a, a vastly different impact of grass reared beef from a UK farm and something from a huge feedlot in America or, or elsewhere in the world. I mean, these are these are fundamentally different production systems and, and the, the amount of carbon that's produced through, through them will be fundamentally different. So I think there's a, you yeah, know, when, we, when we're talking about eating meat at the moment, you're talking about eating slightly less. Um, I think a lot of people are talking about sourcing their meat and thinking about where it comes from. And yes, perhaps perhaps looking at quality, uh, perhaps looking at, at uh, ensuring that it's locally produced, that it's got low food miles, that there's all sorts of other um, things that they can check to ensure that, that the meat that they are eating does have as little impact uh, in terms of as carbon as possible. Uh, but there are, carbon is not the only issue here. Um, there's also a critical issue around biodiversity. And the the idea, for instance, that, that we remove livestock farming from the from from the countryside as a whole, um, which I know is you know it's in a sort of extreme version of this discussion, but but that is the sort of underlying assumption that we move away from livestock production and farming as a whole. And there are huge questions about the impact that that would have on biodiversity, um, which is obviously. You know, uh, uh, you know, the decline of biodiversity is one of the biggest one of the biggest issues facing facing rural communities, and then there's the question of welfare, which Dan raised, which is an interesting one because yes, you know there there are welfare impacts in 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 slaughtering animals. I mean, if you do it well, they should have very little, but but there are welfare issues there. But yeah, you know, the the question is, if we don't farm, we don't have livestock, then. Yeah, we, we don't have livestock. Where well, is the purpose of of the cattle, the sheep? You know, it, it's all very well being absolutely certain that that the welfare at death is protected and that, and that, that things are done humanely. But you know, the the underlying point is if that we don't have a livestock farming system, we don't have livestock. And and is that a countryside that we we want? And would that be a good thing for the countryside as a whole when we're looking beyond just um, carbon at at biodiversity and at, and at sustainable rural communities? That makes a lot of sense, although I have to say in fairness that Don was talking about this being a lab-grown meat and uh, naturally produced meat. That's my terminology, not yours. I fully accept that. But uh, it was an and rather than instead of a uh, d- debate that uh, Don was putting forward. So uh, without wanting to put words in anybody's mouth, Tim, I've made all sorts of assumptions, I, I probably. But what is your view of lab-grown meat? Um, I mean, personally, I've, I've I've not yet had the pleasure. Uh, perhaps I should have should have done. My view is that that, that I'm sure you know, we need to look very carefully at how we are producing meat. There's no doubt about that at all. And I suppose that you know that the fundamental point comes that we, we we're probably going to be producing less, and people will probably eat less, as as you've discussed, uh, as, and, and as I discussed earlier. How you fill the gap between the the amount of meat that people might be eating at the moment and they might they be eating in the future there, there are obviously you know, different options um and you know as 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 dan said i'm a great believer in freedom of choice as well and then and, and people should be able to choose that they may you know other people may choose to to eat more uh, non-meat products but it's it, it certainly should be part of the you know it, I, I see no reason at all it shouldn't be part of a mix and part of a choice my point and i go back to my last that's so my point really is that we need to consider very carefully the, the entire direction of travel. And I'm not suggesting that this is Dan's suggesting or that what, what, what you're suggesting, Guy, but there are many people who want us to who want to see a, a world without livestock production, without livestock farming at all, and many of them want to see a world without farming at all. You know, prominent voices. George Monbiot has written the articles in the, in the Guardian. These are you know, these are prominent voices suggesting this. And and that I do think would be a fundamentally bad thing uh, for the countryside and the country as a whole. Do you want to sound as confident as my interviewee in this episode? If you talk to the press or other media, are you worried you'll be misquoted, or they'll just publish their story and not yours? Clapperton Media Associates can help with coaching. Drop me a note, guy at clapperton.co.uk and we'll arrange a time for an exploratory call. Now, back to the podcast.
There is, of course, this desirability thing, isn't there? If you want to uh, look at those, um, you drive past and look at those cows in a field or sheep in a field or whatever, you have to accept that those are not pets. Uh, they are livestock. They're just destined for either dairy production or the table or for both. I, I, I get that completely. I'm interested, though, in how this uh, stuff's going to get to the market. I mean, I'm speaking from the UK, which has, of course, left the European Union, uh, and I'm sure it will be working on its own food standards in the fullness of time. But, uh, Dan, can I ask you, will you be able to market your produce as meat or uh, either under EU regulations or any others, or will it have another name? Yeah, the, the, I think it's a very interesting question, uh, and it goes both ways, right? So do we want it to be cold meat? And and then I think we're still on the fence about that, because since it is produced in a fundamentally different way, I think it would be unfair to consumers to not at least allude that there is a difference between the traditional product that you get from an animal and the, just the product that we make. I think people, especially when it comes to choice, people should realize that there is a difference. So right now, we are, of course, uh, we have adopted the term cultivated meat, Lab grown, I think, is a bit misleading since eventually this product will be made in a, a food plant. And then I think the lab wouldn't be fair to, to call the plant a, la, a lab. So really, really have a fundamental different approach to this and saying, well, what can we call it? Like, or what should we call it? And I don't think just regular meat should be... Uh, is is fair to say. People should be aware that what they're eating and what it actually happened to the food that they are consuming. So it's all about, again, the choice and then making sure that the consumer understands the choice that they're making. There are already plenty of alternatives, though. I mean, there's corn. And when I was growing up in the 70s, there was this horrific stuff called sauce mix, which as far as I could make out was basically salt with food dye in it. That's long gone. But I've always wondered what the appeal is of pretending to eat meat. I mean, why not just eat veg-based dishes? Why not just eat plant-based dishes and celebrate the fact that they're vegetables? Oh, I, w- I would completely agree with that. I think when you when you compare that market for 10 years, 10 years ago, like you said, you could get salt with food coloring dye. But now I think people have made significant innovation so that there is more choice. But I do think that celebrating the fact that you don't eat meat should be a thing by itself and not saying, well, you're actually eating meat while it's not meat. But that's the thing what I think sets us apart, right? We are actually making meat. It is animal protein and animal fat from the species that we've used to grow uh, grow these tissues from. So uh, that's why I think we're in a, in a different trajectory than the, the plant-based alternatives. Okay. Um, Tim, how crowded is the market for food producers already? And, I mean, interestingly, the demand for red meat, um, whilst you know there, there's lots of discussions going on about eating less and quality, the rest of it, demand seems to see, seem to main, be maintained and be very strong indeed. And as yet, it doesn't seem, and you know, Dan's products coming on the market are, are, as are other products, as yet it doesn't seem that there is any alternative product which is having a substantial impact on, on the, the ability of uh, farmers to sell their produce, of livestock farmers to sell their produce. I think what is interesting, and, and I don't know, fully aware of, of Dan's product range and the rest of it, is that the type of um, livestock production, which is probably the, you know, the the most difficult to justify in terms of uh, of either the environment, you know, of, of the car, uh, you know, in, in relation to carbon or biodiversity or anything else, the, the production of, sort of very large quantities of mainly chicken meat and pig meat, we're using mostly in the UK using imported imported soya as the base of all those feed stuff yeah this is it, it does seem to me always that that is the 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 type of of, uh, of meat product which which is fairly would be fairly easy to replicate either using the sort of the sort of lab grown meat that dan's talking about or indeed as we've already discussed things like you know a corn nugget and a and a, and a chicken nugget from a broiler chicken if we're honest about it fundamentally that there's not a huge amount of difference in terms of taste or texture so uh, you know it's that part of production it would would be the most benefit in replacing i think but the focus of most of the discussion tends to be on red meat which is always always slightly strange just focusing on the meat market overall uh, tim do you see any specific advantages or indeed any potential innovations uh, for any animal based forms of production that's uh, that's coming up well, I mean, I think the discussion is like the one we're having, and, and a much broader discussion about uh, about you know, ethical meat. I think that you would hope that there's a real opportunity for producers who who are 
you know, using grass-fed systems, high welfare standards, um, you know, tr- uh, traditional breeds, um, you, uh, which farmed in a in a manner which is absolutely in line with with best practice of regenerative farming and, and uh, conserving um, the countryside. There should be, and hopefully will be, opportunities to generate a significant premium marketing marketing meat in that way. I mean, for instance, as, a, as a, an example, we use. The net nep the the uh, rewilding project in in the southeast is is used a lot as an example but yeah nep are branding their own meat because uh, they are still farming are producing still quite a lot of a lot of meat um branding that and and i'm quite sure we'll be getting a significant premium for nep meat above the the, the market average and so yeah these are the opportunities i think and they're and increasingly you're seeing uh, the livestock sector you know, looking to to take those opportunities to 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 ensure that they're getting as much as as much as they can for what is a high quality product done tim was saying uh, that he hasn't actually tasted your product uh, and neither have i of course because I, I haven't seen anything on the supermarket shelves and i'm deeply imaginative with my shopping and if it's not in the supermarket i probably won't have seen it so how long is it going to be uh, before we see something and how long is it going to take consumers to accept your alternatives uh, to traditionally produced meat Right, so for for the first question, probably 2025 is going to be first product launch. But just imagining the sheer volumes of meat that people are consuming on a daily basis. Um, somebody said to me that if we have a factory that produces 5,000 kilograms every day, we could fulfill the need of 0.5% of what London eats daily. These numbers are so staggering that for a new innovation like this and to start to get direct big volumes up that you can really see the spread throughout the supermarket, it will take some more time because we have a what is it like a thousand year lag between uh, agricultural farming and where we are today with our product but 2025 first product launch and then afterwards starting to build the factories to increase volume uh, and then hopefully soon after you can start enjoying it in uh, in the supermarkets because i think that is really f- uh, three key important things that we need to reach for people start to mass adopt it one of course is taste you know if it doesn't taste good nobody will buy it and i think that's what we are uh, really for that since we are creating the real thing we don't expect it to taste any different it doesn't uh, the second one is skill enough people need to be able to expose to it to start getting this in their daily lives and the other one needs to be cost so it needs to be as cheap as meat and this is really what we're aiming for with the large scale factories that people will you know just have go to a supermarket stand in front of uh, the meat aisle and have a really realistic choice in what type of proteins they can consume. And uh, I think that uh, that will take a little bit more time for that large scale, but very soon after the first product launch, we are, we're aiming for that. Well, if you can make a, a cheap, uh, really high quality steak, then I'll be very impressed because that's not been my experience, <laughs> but uh, that's uh, possibly just a feature of the sorts of places, the places that I shop. We're running short of time. Uh, this is a fascinating topic. We could do hours on this, I'm sure. But uh, if I could just ask uh, finally, uh, where people can find out more about yourself and your work, uh, Tim? And they can go to our website, the Countryside Alliance website. Google will get you there quickly. And we campaign on a whole range of uh, of rural issues. And uh, yeah, the future of the countryside and the countryside with people in it is what we're all about. Okay, and uh, Dan. Well, of course, our, our website is meetable.com. Uh, but if you want to learn a bit more about what we call cellular agriculture, so the revolution of uh, using cell technologies to create animal protein, good sources are that of GFI and New Harvest. And they can talk to you about the whole range of alternative protein uh, that are made through fermentation processes. But ours, of course, is, uh, is meetable.com. Jim Bonner of the Countryside Alliance and Don Lowning of Meetable. Thank you both very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. And of course, many thanks to you for listening. That was the Near Futurist podcast with me, Guy Clapperton, and my guests in the latest in the series of Dividing Lines, sponsored by Diffusion PR. Don't forget to have a look at the website at uh, nearfuturist.co.uk. That's my media training site at remotemediatraining.com. And of course, please, please do join the LinkedIn uh, group if you'd like to have an atta. I'll be back soon. Thank you again. Mm-hmm.